it's really nice once in a while to go out for a big fancy meal, right? I, I'm not a real foodie kind of guy. I don't get all excited about food too often, but there are some meals in my life that I remember. I remember going out for five course meals once in a while when we were celebrating something great. In fact, actually, one of my Bible teachers had a gourmet cook as a wife, and one day she invited me over for some big supper, and, and it went on for hours, and it was just the most delicious food I'd ever tasted. It was really amazing. If we went around this room today, you could probably remember a fancy meal that you went to, because sometimes fancy meals are really, really good, right? On the other hand, sometimes there's nothing like a hamburger, right? <laughs> something simple, something quick. Sometimes hamburgers just taste so good, especially on a long weekend when you're just relaxing and maybe you're out at the park or the beach or something, and sometimes just a simple hamburger is the best meal you could have. Today's sermon is a hamburger. Sometimes sermons are like a big fancy meal and I tell you epically long stories about something and we wander all over the Bible and, and it's all convoluted and hard to follow and you've got to really think and there's lots to it. Um, today's sermon is a hamburger. Today's sermon is simple. Today's sermon is not hard to understand. Today's sermon is going to be very useful and I hope it's going to be very good. It's going to be the thing you need this long weekend. Something good and refreshing. I came across this passage maybe two or three months ago, and I can't stop thinking about it, and so that's why I'm sharing it with you today. It comes from Proverbs chapter 3, and as I said, it's going to result, hopefully, in you noticing and thinking about two words. It's going to give you two actions, and then two results. The passage says this. The proverb writer writing to give some wisdom to his readers tells them to do this. He says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win the favor and good name in the sight of God and man. That's the passage we're going to focus on today. That's the thing I want you to think about. And in particular, I want you to think specifically as we start about these two words. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Other versions, if you're reading other versions of the Bible, will say, let kindness and trust never leave you. And I, I like these words. I want us to think about these words for half a second today because they are so important. They shape everything we do. I'll use the word kindness instead of love because it isn't actually a way you could translate that word. And when we say the word love, we sometimes get lost. Love is such an ambiguous word. You love your wife, you love your truck, you love the Rough Riders, you love lots of things. But kindness, we understand what it means to be kind. He says, let kindness never leave you. What would it be like if you approached every situation with a kind attitude, with a kind thought, thinking kind things about other people, thinking kind things about their motives, thinking kindly about what's going on around you. What if kind was the word that described you all the time? Typically, most people go into circumstances being judgmental. They go into places and they think, I don't like this. They go to church and they say, I don't like that sermon. I didn't like that song. I didn't think that prayer was long enough. I thought it was too long. I didn't like the way the preacher, whatever. We always look for the negatives. But what if we were the people who said, I'm going to look for the good. I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to look for what I dislike. I'm going to look, like, look for what I do like. I'm not going to be mean. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm not looking for the bad. I'm looking for the good. I'm going to be positive and encouraging, and I'm going to cheer for you. I did a sermon about a year ago where I said that the bottom line of the sermon was that I am cheering for you. We do that for little kids all the time, right? Little kid draws you a picture. You can't understand what that picture is, but you say, that's the most beautiful picture I've ever seen. Way to go, buddy, because that kid has tried something. And you pat them on the back and you cheer for them. You go to their ball games, they're lousy, you cheer for them. Can we cheer for each other? Can we be those people? Can we be defined by love? Can, be, can that be the thing that defines us? 
Because if we even just did that, if, if that's all you got from this sermon today, if you determined I'm going to go out of here today and I'm going to be the kindest person I can be, when I get to the end, I want people to say, I'm the, that's the kindest person I know. If that's all you did, you'd do something huge today. Way back in the 50s, a guy named Dale Carnegie wrote a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He became really well known. Lots of people listened to the things he had to say. Here's one of the things he had to say that I think is really important to think about. And it connects to the idea of kindness and how we think. He said this one time. He says, remember that your happiness doesn't depend on who you are or what you have. Your happiness, your happiness doesn't depend on who you are or what you have. It depends solely upon what you think. So start each day by thinking of all the things you have to be thankful for. Your future will depend very largely on the thoughts you think today. So think thoughts of hope and confidence and love and success. When we choose to be people who think kindly, we are choosing to help ourselves. We are choosing to do something for ourselves that is useful and good because it helps other people and then it helps me. It helps me to see the world better. It helps me to see you better. It helps me to be happier because I'm not looking for what I dislike. I'm looking for what I'm happy about. I'm looking for the good. I'm being kind. Kindness helps everyone. And the, the proverb writer says, you can find that, hold on to that, never let that leave you. Never let that leave you. You be the kindest of all people. I like the second word he puts up there too. He says, I want you to ne never let kindness leave you. I never want you to let faithfulness leave you. I want you to be faithful. Faithful is a word that we often use in church. And people you throw it around as a churchy word. People say, oh, that Calvin, he's a faithful guy. Mary's faithful. And we talk about it as a church word, but it's not a church word. It's not a word about church. It's a word about consistency. It's a word about who you are all the time. And so I like that when he says, I want you to be kind and I want you to be faithful. I want you to be faithful to the good things. I want you to consistently do the right thing over and over and over again. That's the picture here. He, he's talking about frequency. Because here's the thing. Anybody can do nice things once in a while. Anybody can do the right thing sometimes. Anybody can be kind on someone's birthday, but can you be kind to them on Tuesday, right? That's the difference. Can you do it all the time? Can this be who you actually are? Can it be the part of us that, that doesn't change? Can it never change? So I want faithfulness to never leave you. I want faithfulness to be your mark. I want you to be consistent. That is one of the things God's word talks about all the time, is the idea of consistency. That we aren't just who we are on Sunday morning all dressed up and happy and oh yeah, I'm really... But then we go and talk behind each other's backs or we're mean to people or we treat people from other countries rudely or we make fun of people. That's not who we are. That's not faithfulness. That's not being consistent. That's not... That's not right. In fact, um, if you've got your Bibles open, I want to show you something in the New Testament from James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, the, James is writing and talking about how we act and how we treat each other. What we do, he's talking about consistency. L listen to what he says here. In James chapter 3, verse 9, he says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. With our tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse men who have been made in God's image. This shouldn't be. Right? You shouldn't praise God on Sunday morning, sing all these nice songs, say amen to the prayers, and then go home and treat people like garbage. That's not consistent. That's not faithful. He says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? It's, it's a rhetorical question. It's a good question. Can you get both good water and bad water out of the same well? Of course not. You, you get one or the other. In fact, the bad water will wreck the good water. So if you're trying to walk the line, if you're trying to be both, if you're trying to pretend you're nice but actually you're a jerk, you're really a jerk. That's the answer, right? Fresh water and salt water can't come from the same well. It just doesn't work. It, it's got to be consistent. It's one or the other. It's not both. 
He says in verse 12, my brothers, can fig trees bear olives? Can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He says you can't be both. What I want you to be is consistent. I want you to frequent, I want the frequency of your kindness to never leave. I, I want you to be the same person every time someone meets you. They never have to put up their guard. They never have to be worried that you're going to be mean to them now, even though you were kind to them before. You're just going to be kind all the time. That's what he says. I want you to be consistent. So those are the two words. I told you I'm giving you two words. Those are your two words. Kind and consistent. Lovely and faithful. If, if you forget nothing, if you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember those two words. Think about them this week. Put them in action somewhere. But... If you want to know where to put them into action, if you want to know what to do with those two words, he tells you the next two things. He tells you, here's what to do with those things. Now that you've focused on those words and you're thinking about them, here's what to do about them. He says, I want you then to bind them around your neck. And I want you to write them on the tablet of your heart. Sounds all poetic, but it's actually really good instruction. If you're going to be kind and consistent, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bind them around your neck. I want you to wear kindness and faithfulness like a necklace or a tie. I want you to bind it around your neck so everyone can see it. Everyone who looks at you sees your necklace with the cross on it or the pearls or whatever it is. They can see it. It's visible. I want these things to be visible. I want you to wrap them around your neck so no one can miss them. Oh, and by the way, the other thing I want you to do, I want you to write them on your heart. The first one is visible. Everyone can see it. The second one's invisible. I want you to have it on the inside. I want it written on your heart. I want it to be who you really are all the time. I want it to be both external and internal. And, and both of those things, visible and around your neck and written on your heart, both of those things are important because one without the other doesn't work. If you're only kind and faithful and good on the outside, but inside you're not, everybody knows it because you're a fake. Everybody can see that. Everyone knows a fake pretty quickly. If, on the other hand, it's written on your heart, on the inside, but no one ever sees it, then you never influence anyone. I think all kinds of nice thoughts about Jeff, but I never say anything nice to Jeff, so Jeff is never encouraged by me. I never influence him. He never sees it. Right? got to be both. As I was thinking of a way to illustrate this, I, mean, I came up with this, and, and it's probably the weakest, strangest, dumbest illustration I've ever used of anything. But the idea that it's got to be both inside and outside, when I was thinking about this, this is the first thought that came to my head, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. I like it. I thought about chocolate marble cakes. <laughs> you want to be a chocolate marble cake. That's what you want to be. You want to have that thick, beautiful icing on the outside that everyone sees. It's so delicious looking. When you go to the dessert table at a potluck and you're looking around, you see something with really thick chocolate icing on it, you go, oh yeah, that's, that's good. I like that. that. That's positive, right? But when you cut into that thing, it's not just chocolate on the outside. That chocolate is swirled around and it's everywhere right? It's everywhere in that cake. And there's not a part of that cake that you can cut into and not find the cake or the chocolate on the inside. That's who we are. That's what he's praying for. That's what he wants them to be like. I want this so visible that everybody says that ah, you're the nicest person I've seen, but I want it on the inside. So it's actually true. I want it on the inside. So there's no part of you that is not touched by the word of God. Everything you do, is influenced by the Word of God because it's written on your heart. So the way you talk to people, the way you talk about people, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you use your, use your days, whatever it is, think about anything. He says, I want it to be influenced by who you really are. All swirled through every single part of you Nothing is exempt from the good things of God. Now he says, if you think about these two words, love and kindness, or kindness and faithfulness, or whatever the two words you want to choose there are, 
Um, choose those exact words. Choose those words. I want you then to put them in action. Let people see it and write them on your own heart. Here's what's going to happen. Here's the result. And the result might be really interesting to you. The result, he says, if you do these things, if you focus on love and faithfulness, if you let them be visible and actually inside of you, then you will win favor and you will get a good name in the sight of both God and man. He says the result is going to be that it will make everything better. Every last part of your life will be better if you think about love and faithfulness. If you let people see that and write it on your heart, every single part of your life will be better. Every single thing. Whether it's a re your relationship with man or with God, others will like you. You will be effective and helpful. You will do things that are impressive and useful. Others will think well of you. Your name will be good and, they, and you will actually be good. Now here's the odd part. Here's the strange part. And that is that sometimes I've convinced myself that if I'm going to have an influence in this world, if I'm going to make a difference, if I'm going to do something good, it's got to be something big. Right? I've got to do something big. I've got to preach in a big church, or I've got to offer a donation of a million dollars somewhere, or I've got to do something huge. I've got to do something huge before it's important. Scripture never, ever, ever says you've got to do something huge to do something important. In fact, most of the time, Scripture says it's the little things that are going to be the important things. You, you move people and influence people in, in little tiny ways instead of in great big ways. Some of you know I like outer space and, and NASA stuff and all sorts of things. We've been to Cape Canaveral, went to, the, went to NASA down there and saw all the moon stuff and everything. I was reading the other day about NASA has a plan to protect the Earth when a comet is coming towards the Earth. They're always worried that some sort of meteor or a comet's going to come and just destroy the whole Earth. And so they're, def they're def making a defense plan. They're trying to come up with something to keep us safe when that happens. And you know what they're going to do? They've developed rockets now that if they see a, a comet or a meteorite or something coming towards the Earth that's threatening us, they're going to shoot this rocket up and, 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 and they're going to have it intercept that comet. But you know what it's going to do? It's not going to blow it up. It's not going to destroy it because they can't, right? Most of the time, meteors that are coming towards the Earth, if they're so big, they're going to destroy us. They're... They can't get rid of it. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to shoot a rocket up. Here's their plan. I'm going to shoot a rocket up, and it's just going to go, boink. It's just going to hit it. And when that rocket comes up and hits it, doink, it's going to knock it off in a different trajectory, and it's going to go away. They're not going to destroy it. They're just going to, boom, bump it. Let me tell you something. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. You can't make anybody do something. You can't make anybody think a certain way. All you can do is punk. All you can do is just dunk. You can not hit them. Well, all you can do is just influence them. You just nudge them in a different direction. You can give them something else to think about. You can do something that changes the way they think, right? All you can do is just a little, but that's good enough. That actually changes things. That makes a difference. Your good little kindnesses. Your good way of living actually bumps into people and makes them think differently. And that is huge. How do I know that? Scripture tells us that. I wrote this up on the screen. You may not be able to see it very well, but if you've got your Bibles, Acts chapter 2 is where this comes from. You can read it from your own. But this is a description of the early church. Right after the church got started. And here's how they're described. And I want you to think about the fact that none of these things they're described as doing are huge. They're just little. They're just tiny. But they're big. You understand? So he says this. They, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. In other words, they were friends with each other. And they devoted themselves to those things. To the truth and to being friends. They devoted themselves to teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, so the Lord's table, and eating together, maybe both, and they devoted themselves to prayer. Being friends and praying and thinking about things of God do not seem like big things, but they're huge. They really are big things. It says everyone, because they were doing these things, 
Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. Notice it doesn't say the people were inspired because of the wonders and signs done by the apostles. The wonders and signs happened because the people were fellowshipping and praying and kind and loving and eating together. Because they were doing those small things, then God started doing big things among them. But it was the small things that were the important part. They were the starter. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. Are we keeping track yet? If somebody had need, they would give it to them. They would help out. They were generous. They were sharing. They, they spent time together doing what anyone else needed, those sorts of things. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. Look at that last line. Look at that line there that I just read. Maybe not the last line yet, but the line I just read. They did all these little things. They ate together. They were friends. They were kind. They were generous. They did all these small things. And it said that they praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. People liked them because they were just good. And every time you were around them, they kind of doink, made you better. Oh, by the way, the Lord then added to their number daily because people were being saved. People wanted to be part of that. People wanted to be part of a group that was just kind and nice and good and always kind and nice and good and faithful and always doing those things and were the chocolate marble cake that looked nice and were really actually nice people. And God added to their number. But notice, people like them and God like them, which is exactly what this verse said would happen. If you do the little things, people will like you and God will be honored and God will be pleased with you as well. That's the result. It doesn't have to be big. Little things make a huge difference. There's a, there's a bird that lives around Estevan. He lives around southern Saskatchewan. lives around water just generally around the world. The bird's called a kingfisher. If you've seen, ever seen a kingfisher on Surus, if you ever go kayaking, you'll see them all the time. Kingfishers sit up in the trees, and they will, they will sit there for a while, and then they'll just dive into the water, and they'll catch a fish and take off. That's why they're called kingfishers, right? They fish. There's a, there's a photographer who got an amazing picture of a kingfisher. Look at this picture. Isn't that amazing? That is the second, that is the millisecond before that kingfisher hit that water and grabbed the fish he was going after. Isn't that an amazing shot? The water is so clear and the reflection is perfect. The, the photographer's name, Mario Sanchez. It took Mario Sanchez six years and more than 720,000 pictures to get that one. Six years and 720,000 pictures before he got one that was just beautiful and perfect. When I look at that picture, I'm reminded of what we're talking about this morning. I'm reminded that when you just keep doing the right thing over and over, when you continue to be kind and you do it consistently, when you show it outside and it's written on the inside of you, it's actually who you are, then good things will happen. But what it requires is that you just keep doing it. You're not going to get this picture on the first try. It might take 720,000 tries to get it right. But when you keep doing it, something beautiful is going to take place. When you keep trying, something beautiful will happen because God will make something happen. It's not going to happen with one try. It's going to happen when we're consistently doing the right things. So brothers and sisters, two words, two actions, two results. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your hearts. Then you will win the favor of God. And it's not coming any other way. Can we do the little things well? Can we realize that little things are big things? Can we actually be who we claim to be, not just talk about it? Can it be swirled all the way through us? Because if we can do that consistently, something wonderful will happen. 
I guarantee it because God says so. Brothers and sisters, bind these things on you. See if it works. Give it a try. God might do something you've never imagined before. Let's take our communion supplies and think of those back for a second right now. Once again, if you didn't pick up your communion supplies, there's some on the table at the back. Feel free to jump up and grab some so you have what you need. One of the things I think we get wrong when we come to the table is that we remember all the time that Jesus was the Son of God. That may seem like a dumb statement. That's not a wrong thing. That's actually a true thing, but it hurts us in a way. When I was a kid, I remember going to Sunday school and everybody and all my Sunday school teachers telling me about all the great things Jesus did. And I used to think to myself, well, yeah, but he was the Son of God. Like, of course he's going to do those things. Of course he's going to be kind to people who are mean to him. Of course he's going to uh, do the right thing all the time. Of course he is. He's the Son of God. But when we think that way, we misunderstand something. We misunderstand the fact that not only was he the son of God, but he was still a man. And Jesus actually did fight with the need to say, am I going to follow or am I not? In fact, Jesus actually did fight with the thinking about, do I want to do my will or God's will? Do I want to do it my way or God's way? In fact, he prayed about that on his last night. Can I do it a different way or do I have to do it your way? And if I have to do it your way, then your will be done. But if there's another way, I, I think we hurt ourselves when we only think about Jesus as the Son of God because sometimes we think then he just kind of floated through everything, that nothing really affected him. That when people yelled at him or treated him poorly, he didn't care. When people died, it didn't matter. That's not true. He cried at the tombs. He heard the nasty words. But he continued to do the right things because he was who he was supposed to be all the way through. And because he wasn't deterred, because he continued to love and be faithful, then his sacrifice did something that no one could have imagined. On, on, on the day he was crucified, no one could have imagined we'd still be talking about it. Because they just thought he was another guy being hung on a cross. But today, today we're still talking about it because it's still important. It still won something bigger than what they understood. Consistency, serving God consistently, doing what God wants, hearing ourselves say to him, not my will, but yours be done, is the starting of actually being a disciple, a follower, someone who really believes in God, not just talks about it. As we partake of the table today, can we think about Jesus who said, not my will, but yours be done. And can we use that then to remind ourselves that that needs to be my attitude too. I need to hear what God wants. I need to try and live that every single day. Not to earn something, but because I've been given something. Something that I could have never have earned. Let's remember the sacrifice of his body at this time. Father, help us to uh, today focus on your son in a way that um, that really affects us. Help us not to just do this because we always do it, but help us to remember. Help us to actually remember the gift we've been given, the eternity that's coming, and then how we want to live and what that means for us. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus on the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for hope. We thank you for the joy that is coming. We thank you for strength in hard times. Help us to think about all those things, because all of those things are part of this gift. Would you bless each person as they partake in your son's name? Father, thank you for the blood that washed us clean. Thank you that Jesus offered.
offered himself that we get his righteousness. Father, when we stumble and fall and when we, when we become unclean again, help us to remember there's a way home through the cross and repentance. Help us to remember that you're always waiting to forgive, but help us always to value that cleansing and being clean and being forgiven. Help us not to take sin lightly, but to see it for what it really is, as a separation from you. Today, as we partake of this, help us to be drawn back to you and help us to remember the blessing we have. Thank you for this reminder and for the blood in your son's name. For those who've been watching online, we're going to end it there, but we thank you for watching, and maybe we'll see you another time. Thanks for watching.